Good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to have you all here at our premises in central Dublin and those joining online. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the director of research here at the IIA, the IIEA, all the vowels. It's a real pleasure to be working with colleagues in the, in the Czech embassy. It's been a long time coming, but we're very, very happy to be engaged in this partnership. Thank you to friends in the in the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well, who are represented here and for sponsoring this event. I'm going to hand over to to Philippe Vorm, who's the uh, Charge d'Affaires at the Czech Embassy, who might introduce the the rest of the event. But thanks all for being here, and I hope it is. I know it will be a very stimulating hour. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to open this event. Energy security has become a hot topic of international politics in the recent years, particularly following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Many more people in Europe and around the world now realize that the energy can be weaponized. The continuous and secure supply of energy at affordable prices can no longer be taken for granted. Our energy dependency on countries that do not share our values or even pose a threat to our security should be reconsidered. Another important factor to consider in this context is the ongoing energy transition. If executed properly, it might help us secure our energy self-sufficiency. However, could, could also bring about some economic and social challenges in the short and medium term. This is why I believe a serious and well-informed discussion on energy security is timely. I dare say that in Ireland, the political and academic debate on this matter has been much less intense than in the countries of Central Europe. For this reason, I believe it is worthwhile for the Irish audience to hear about the Czech Republic's particular experience with this issue. In our country, it would be extremely difficult to find someone more competent on this subject than the ambassador at large for energy security, Václav Bartuška. He is a luminary in the realm of diplomacy and energy policy, serving as the ambassador at large for energy security of the Czech Republic for nearly 17 years. He has been instrumental in navigating complex geopolitical landscapes to secure energy resources and foster international cooperation. Beyond his ambassador role, he is a valued member of administrative board of ACER, the Agency for the Cooperation of Energy Regulation, Regulators, and EU agency committed to enhancing pan-European energy regulation. Moreover, Ambassador Václav Bartuška is not only a policy expert, but also a symbol of resilience and change. He was one of the students' leaders who played a crucial role in the November 1989 Velvet Revolution that reshaped the Czech Republic's destiny. It, I would like to extend a special thanks uh, to Institute of International U and European Affairs for hosting this event. For all of you who are in attendance, and I also like to acknowledge the support of the uh, Department of United Nations of the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs for uh, their role in advancing international dialogues as uh, this this one. And uh, last but not least, uh, to Ambassador Václav Bartuška himself. Thank you very much. I would like to pass the word to my colleague from the Ministry, Iri Yilak. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's also my pleasure to address you very briefly on, on the occasion of this event focused on energy, energy security, energy transition. I'm not an energy expert. I represent that part of our ministry, which is focused on the United Nations, uh, on the uh, international organizations, multilateral diplomacy, and some global affairs. We follow, among others, uh, the Agenda 2030 for sustainable development. And I'm saying that for, for two reasons. One is that within the program of promotion of uh, our activities and uh, information and knowledge, we uh, also uh, uh, had a pleasure to contribute to this event as such. And second, 
it is also because energy and energy issues lie in the heart of uh, Agenda 2030 for sustainable development itself, and also in the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. When the UN General Assembly in 2015 adopted 2030 Agenda, uh, it included uh, since the beginning a, a dedicated and standalone goal on energy, SDG 7, calling to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. As we know, uh, on a halfway on the implementation of uh, all 17 uh, sustainable development goals, uh, we uh, found this implementation quite in deep trouble. Uh, we had it confirmed uh, only two weeks ago when the top meeting uh, SDG summit took place in New York. I want to use this opportunity also to appreciate very much the work of Irish diplomat and Ireland as such, because Irish diplomats were those who were drafting the main outcome of the SDG summit, namely the political declaration. Uh, in the current uh, multiple um, crisis, including COVID-19 pandemic uh, and unjustifiable Russian aggression against Ukraine, it all have led, of course, to um, slowdown of uh, implementation of, uh, of all SDGs. We in the EU should not be so much alarmed because uh, we, uh, unlike, let's say, the global picture, perform quite well in general in many concrete indicators. Czechia is currently, uh, according to rankings which uh, were published recently this year, uh, is currently at the eighth position and Ireland on 17th position among 166 United Nations member states assessed in achieving sustainable development goals. Although the final score of SDG 7 implementation is quite satisfactory in our cases, and the majority of the indicators are either fulfilled or on track, we still have, of course, a lot of work to do. We know that, for example, on the renewable energy uh, sources, according to this, uh, to this uh, uh, indexes, of course, Ireland is performing slightly better than the Czech Republic, although the uh, whole score was the contrary. At the beginning, at, at, the, at the conclusion, let me uh, thank also from my side to uh, IIEA for organizing it, to my colleagues from the Czech Embassy, and especially to Ambassador Bartuszka for having you here. Thank you. So, uh, Ambassador, I'll just introduce if you want. No, just one, just one second, because I have a few. Uh, so I just want to welcome uh, everybody here today and also quite a number of people who are um, joining us online for energy security in Central Europe, which is an extremely important topic. And uh, thank you, obviously, to the colleagues from the Czech um, Embassy and uh, from the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And of course, a, a big welcome to Ambassador Matuszek. Um, just some uh, housekeeping rules. Um, Ambassador Matush uh, will speak Baru will speak to us uh, for about 20 minutes, and then we will go to question and answer with our audience and uh, of course, everybody in the room is welcome to um, uh, ask a question and uh, we have a roving mic. And uh, to those uh, online, uh, they will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, which uh, you should see on your screen. And please feel free to send questions in during the course of the talk. And when Ambassador Batushka has finished, uh, we, we will come to them. Uh, the, please also feel free to join the, on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Uh, just a very short note on this, on the importance of this talk. Uh, the IEA definition uh, um, is, uh, uh, of energy security is uninterrupted availability of energy uh, sources at an affordable price. Uh, reliability, resilience, and efficiency are the four A's as we talk about them. Um, uh, availability, affordability, accessibility, and importantly, uh, acceptability. Um, and there's huge national and international implications on energy security, geopolitics, uh, consumers, uh, industry, and climate. 
And um, the war on Ukraine, of course, has upended the whole energy security supply uh, in Europe and also even beyond. There's nobody better to talk to us and to outline the challenges in this than a Master Batushek. And it's your, uh, the floor is yours and we welcome you, you today. Well, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the invitation here. Thank you to our ambassador for getting me out the way from Prague to Ireland. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a short presentation in the beginning just to explain why this topic might have been important at the moment. It's just a snapshot and feel free to ask questions afterwards. I cannot cover all of it at all. At all. Uh, the basic question why it became this area became important in energy security from the security point of view is the dependency of Europe on imports. We spend roughly 400, 400 billion euros a year on oil and gas export imports to the European Union because Europe basically doesn't have much of all its own resources except for the, a bit of uh, Dutch and Romanian resources. There's plenty of imports from around the world. So what do we import from country A or country B? We are all very much dependent on the outside world. And I will show you on the next slide how much we are dependent on things we cannot control and cannot predict. Over the summer of this year, there were actually two events, which uh, one completely did nothing to the market in Europe, absolutely zero impact, while the other increased the price of natural gas in Europe in a single day by more than 30%. One of these events was attempt of coup by Mr. Prigozhin and his troops. So march on Moscow, stopping just short of Moscow, shooting down some helicopters, a real danger of possible overthrow of regime in nuclear country in one of the major countries, countries of the world. So that's event one, A. Event B, 150 guys on a gas platforms off the coast of Australia threatened to go on strike. Prigozhin school did nothing, zero impact on the price of gas in Europe. You know, the gas, the Russian ability to define the price of natural gas in Europe is zero. Since of summer of last year, Russia doesn't export natural gas to any important member states in the EU. It imports, it still exports natural gas to four member states, Hungary, Slovakia, Austria, and Bulgaria, but the main markets are gone. Germany, France, Italy, and so forth. Its ability to influence the price in Europe is zero. So a threat of possible coup in a nuclear country is zero. The Woodside Energy is a company in Australia which drills offshore Australian northwest waters, 150 guys on the gas platforms, on the drills in the sea, threatened, just threatened to strike. They didn't go on strike yet. They wanted $300,000 per year as minimum wage, and they got it. And that simple threat of possible strike in a one week time is what pushed the price in Europe by 30% in a single day. So when somebody says that my country, A or B in Europe, is not really dependent on outside world, that's not really true. The reason why we got so much support in our EU Council presidency last year from member states like Spain or Italy or Ireland and others was that you know, the threat of difficulties with supplies from Russia was a difficulty for everybody in the EU 27. We're all dependent on, dependent on, the, on the outside world. Now, next slide will be terrifying. It comes from our meetings with, we have a German, Czech-German co coordination group on energy for the last more than 10 years. We discuss what to do and how to com communicate energy. A couple of years back, we asked a think tank to have a simple graphics, to, something to show to people to explain energy in simple terms. And this think tank took it really seriously. I'm not sure they understood the word simple. They showed us this. Now, you know, <laughs> EU is not really good in communicating quite often. Uh, please do not mention this to anyone. We would scare everybody from the EU policies. It's very thorough. I've spent one day really complicated going through all of it. It's excellent. It covers all possible relationships between stakeholders, concerns, needs, whatever. It is really a very good work of several people for a long time. But you know, if you show this to every EU citizen, he will run away, away, he will run away screaming from the room. I mean, that's this is not a way how to talk to people about energy or about anything else, to be honest. So we thank very much to think time for the work and we never showed it again to anyone, except for audiences which we want to terrify like you right now, okay? And please don't mention it. 
Okay, the next one, the next slide is uh, about uh, the pipelines from Russia to Europe for natural gas. That's actually a very interesting story. Russia was absolutely sure when, when it started the war last year that Europe simply cannot get rid of Russian natural gas. It will not, it would not want because of the price, but it simply cannot, even if it wanted. Russia supplied roughly 40%, four zero, of European gas consumption in 2021, roughly 145 BCM, billion cubic meter. It was very difficult. It would be impossible to get that amount of gas elsewhere in the world in the short term. They were absolutely sure that we will simply forget Ukraine and let it be because we want cheap gas. That was their hope, that was their expectation, and they were wrong. Now, this is from the consumer page, the page of the European Council. This is one of the most impressive graphics you can find in energy field in, in, anywhere in the world. To have a major buyer get rid, of, get rid of major supplier in a space of several months is unheard of. It's like US getting rid of Saudi or Venezuelan supply in a very short term. It's really impressive. This is what Europe managed to do last year. There's, there's been zero Russian gas coming to Germany or my country since August of last year. That's really impressive. What's even more impressive is the next slide, which is the price of natural gas at GTF exchange in Netherlands. Because despite the replacement of natural gas, by early this year, by February of this year, we already had lower prices than before the war started. There was a huge spike of the prices in August last year, throughout the summer. You may remember that the electricity price went up to tenfold and the gas price as well. But the gas price at the moment is really below the level of prices which were before the war. Impressive, really impressive. I have to say something which is politically incorrect, but so it's true. We Europeans screwed the world completely. We sucked the LNG from places like Bangladesh and Pakistan, East Asia and so forth. We behaved very, very egoistically, but we managed. Europe is actually able to act very, very tough when it needs to. We did the same with vaccines against COVID-19 two years earlier. We can act very tough. We don't talk about it usually, and probably this is the part of my speech which will not be liked by many, but that's the way it is. I mean, we want Europe to be able to act, and Europe is able to act very, very tough. In oil, similar story. You, have, you see a huge decrease of the Russian su supplies into Europe. Of course, it's being replaced by other suppliers, US, Kazakhstan, Norway, <laughs> Saudi Arabia. I have to say one thing here, which is really unpleasant sometimes to hear. To replace one supplier of oil or gas with another is relatively easy, but the next supplier will not always be a nice one. The, the vision of some Europeans that there is this huge pool of lovely human rights feeling oil and gas is nonsense. There are very few democracies in the world which export oil and gas. You can count them on one hand. And the rest of suppliers are countries which either, let's say, are like, like Russia or even more difficult. So you can expect a couple of years from now that people will ask questions about human rights in Equatorial Guinea or Qatar or other places. Let's be honest about it. We want oil, we want gas, we will need oil and gas for decades to come. Despite all the green stuff, you will need it. It will be sometimes coming from very difficult places. The next slide is about something that happened last year, which completely changed perception of, for, for many people. Now, if I had this talk two years ago, the main topic would be inevitably about a pipeline in, North, in the Baltic Sea from Russia to Germany. It was a topic for 15 years. Everybody has, has heard the name. Everybody talked about it. For some reason, since September of last year, people stopped asking about the pipeline. I don't know why. Um, something happened. It's also the reason actually why I went to Norway last month and it was made the big, big part of the talk here in Ireland. You may have been neutral country, but there are some things which might happen even to neutral countries. By the way, the blow up last year happened to a NATO country called Denmark, but also a neutral country called Sweden. Somebody, whoever did that, did, it, did a very good job. The attack happened outside of the national waters, the territorial waters of Denmark and Sweden, but inside their economic zones. The timing of the attack was excellent, very well done. It was done professionally by people who knew exactly what they're doing. 
And if there was ever a wake up call for Europe about what energy security actually means, this is it. Now I've been in my job for 17 years. The first 15 years were mostly about diversification and costs. How much will something cost? And how can we get it cheaper? The last year and a half is about security, the hard security, to make sure that things don't blow up, the things that the, to make sure that we will have light and oil and what we need. That's a very fundamental change. Something about the speed of governments being able to act. Germany has been discussing LNG terminals for 35 years, it was similar in Ireland, similar in other places. This is what we have done last year. You know, Germany suddenly has built four LNG terminals in a space of less than a year. France in, in large, huge with Dunkirk, Belgium in, in large, Zeebrugge. You know, things were suddenly possible very, very fast. What's also actually impressive here is we usually see governments as slow and companies as quick. Well, in normal times, probably yes. In time of crisis, governments are the fast ones. Companies are the slow ones. Uh, because in, at the level of government, you need basically agreement of very few people. Germany approved the first LNG terminal called Brinsbüttel on this on March fifth of last year. So basically, the tenth day of the war. It was basically approved by the government meeting in a single session in the in space of two hours. The chancellor, the finance minister, minister of economy agreed that was it. The Brinsbüttel terminal was paid for by from by fifty percent by the German government by the bank KfW. 40% was Dutch government through Gasuni, which is 100% owned by the state. 10% was RWE, which is a private loan company in Germany. The German Dutch governments approved on the single day for the company. You know, the companies have structures, you need to talk to board and so forth. It took a couple of weeks. Interesting. So government governments can help. My country, Czech Republic, we secured the LNG terminal in Emshausen in Holland in June last year through direct talks with the governments. We have LNG since supplies in summer last year. We have basically now gas from Norway, Netherlands, and the LNG, mostly from the US. And the last couple of slides are about the country I know something about, which is Russia. That's been my specialty before I joined foreign ministry. Uh, one difficulty we really have at the moment is we have no one who really talks to the guy in charge. There's only one guy who's in charge. It's basically impossible for most people around the world to actually meet him. This is how he meets his closest collaborators. The guy on the left is head of the presidential administration. On the right side is the prime minister, Mishustin. Behind, behind him is Sergei Kirienko, who was the deputy head of administration in charge of, in charge of Ukraine. Lately, the lady on the right side of the far end is Mrs. Nabiulina, head of central bank. Those are the people who can actually get physically in the room with him. Most people he just sees on the screen. Uh, I. I was actually doing for my government uh, the kind of contact until the war broke out. I was the guy meeting people like Sechin and Kirienko in the past. Those are basically unavailable these days. And of course, I'm not going to go to Moscow. What is really missing now is the direct contact with Russia at the highest level. A meeting Lavrov means nothing. He doesn't mean anything inside the structures. The people who really matter are different and they are usually not visible. Why it matters is would be basically a question on the last slide. It matters because there's only one who makes decisions and it's increasingly visible that because very few people get to meet him, more and more decisions on the Russian side are done with few mistakes. And I will ask you if you can find out what's wrong with this building. This is for me a good parallel of what situation today. It's, called, it's a hotel called Moscow, Gastinza Moscow. It's right next to the Kremlin in the center of Moscow. It was built in 1932 to 35, in the Stalin time. What's wrong with the building? Okay, I, I help you out. Pardon? No, no, I help you out. Okay, so it was built at the height of the so-called socialist realism, and the basic of the realism was total symmetry. It's a, it's a beautiful story. In 1932, the Communist Party Committee of Moscow had competition for the new, very important Gastinza Hotel in the center of Moscow. They had two final proposals, which were both sent to Stalin to approve for him to decide which one should be built. They both came back signed 
stare in the word adabriayu, I agree. Now, in Moscow 1932, you could do two things. One would be you pick up both plans, go back to Kremlin and say, well, Tavarish Stalin, you made a mistake. You could do that, sure. Or you could bang the heads of the architects and tell them, you idiots, you got, you got us into this trouble. You merge your plans and make a building which will have both plans in it. This is it. Now, you're smiling. But honestly, we see more and more decisions on the Russian side, which are done people who are in total fear of someone who is not really too afraid to punish. We've seen what happened to Prigozhin last month in August. And uh, it's very difficult to meet. So people are trying to guess. People are just like with Stalin, people are trying to guess what he really wants. Not easy job, to be honest. So I will end up with this. Thank you for your attention. I'm ready for the questions if you can. My goodness, Ambassador you really have um, given us a lot to think about. I think those slides probably contained more information uh, than, than uh, reading many books and uh, many of it, uh, much of it obviously new and uh, uh, extremely important and interesting. Um, may I start off the questions and I say I will invite questions and, and to our people online and anybody who is asking a question, perhaps you could identify yourself uh, so that we know uh, who is asking. Um, this is a little bit different. How do you see the future for energy security in Europe? And I'm talking in the immediate future because people are looking to next winter they're looking to the winter afterwards. What is your assessment of how secure is our energy security in Europe? Well, I've said many times since the war broke out last year that we will have three difficult winters in Europe because replacing all the amount of natural gas will take some time. There will be more energy ca capacities available in the market by 2025, 26. Australia, Qatar, African countries, and so forth. But for the last winter we had and the two coming winters, we will still compete for natural gas with other buyers. We will sometimes, sometimes have to overpay. But we did fulfill the storages. We also went through the last winter. And psychologically, we understand we can survive without Russia. We can survive, not freeze. But if there is one thing I'm afraid of, it's a physical attack. Right. Because that would be the way how to plunge Europe into difficulty. You know, in the case of Ireland, uh, just for understanding, there's a single pipeline called Langelet, which goes from the field called Langelet in Norway to Britain. It supplies 20% of British needs. Should something happen to the pipeline, you might feel it as well. There are the pipelines from Norway to France, Germany, Belgium, and Netherlands. Currently, Norway supplies 30%, 30% of the European gas supplies. So I would really take the Nord Stream 1 and 2 blow up last year as a warning. And are you satisfied that the sharing arrangement in Europe will provide uh, sufficient energy security, say for the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, that uh, you have a big sharing arrangement with Germany? Uh, how is it working between the countries of Central and Eastern Europe? Well, I, I think it's different for each country, to be honest. And there are, as I said, still four countries which import Russian gas. So I think this is slightly different for them. My government actually said before the war started that we want to secure LNG terminal in neighboring country. In the end, the neighboring country turned out to be Netherlands. We have no border with them, but we said it was friendly. We also actually started to import natural gas from Algeria through Italy this summer. And you know, sharing, I believe in helping each other when each country is actually willing to do something. So we have spent on the LNG terminal in Holland. We have actually we've been buying cargoes of LNG from around the globe. Uh, and that's a visible step. So we have, I would say, a very good relationship with Germany. At the same time, we did not have a big crisis yet in Europe. And, and only in crisis, we will find out how friendly we are to each other. Yes. Um, 
Any question? Uh, yes, please. And two at the back. Uh, Fargal, would you like to have a question first? Yeah, uh, thank and the, uh, at the back and Kia. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. I'm Fergal McNamara. I'm from Davy an Investment Bank here in Dublin. And uh, I think you laid out very impressively how Europe responded to the energy security issues with replacing the uh, gas source and the oil sources from different uh, different locations around the world. A truly impressive sort of move. And I, I agree with you that the big risk on energy security is the distributed nature of our uh, energy infrastructure, the substations and gas compressor stations and so on. But the other side of the coin is the whole energy transition to an electric future and the role that indigenous resources, solar, wind, hydro and so on can play in electrif electrification, the source of electrification generated in Europe itself. And I'm wondering about that same resolve that we saw of the collective solidarity resolve, the construction of the LNG terminals in the North Sea and, and so on, how all of that uh, could be sort of harnessed or, or, or built upon uh, to accelerate the energy transition. Thank you very much. We are, uh, yes, if you take that. Um, okay. We are in Europe, we are fastest when we are threatened. In crisis, Europe functions very well. In good times, we're very, very slow. So I would say that crisis helps us. And this one is not over yet. So I would say that there is understanding among member states that we need to do much more. It will be different in each member state. And for my country, for France, nuclear is part of the answer, which certainly is not the case with some of the countries of the EU. And that's fine. You should be diverse. We are diverse. We will be diverse. And we will definitely have to question much more closely where do new energy sources come from, where they are being manufactured. You know, there's actually live, at the moment very lively debate in Germany whether all the money spent on subsidies for photovoltaic will really help basically just the makers of the photovoltaic panels in China. They didn't create too many jobs in Germany. And I think the big part of the answer will be in Europe. You know, how many jobs you can create in Europe, how many, how much of the money we spend on an energy transition ends up in Europe, how much of that we make here in Europe. I can hardly imagine that we would spend trillions of EU funds or euros on something that will end up elsewhere. We cannot afford that. So that would be the big debate ahead. It was it does sound very grubby. You know, it's very nice to speak about the green future. It sounds very grubby when you speak about money. But I think that's that's the real moment to actually when the real discussion starts. How much money will actually end up in Europe in the pockets of you and me, of European citizens? We have to be able to have that argument and to explain to the public that this is something that in the end helps all of us. Thank you, thank you. The gentleman at the back. Um... Thank you, Ambassador, oh, yeah. for your presentation. It was. Very interesting. Uh, my name is Keen Fitzgerald. I'm the security and defense researcher here at the IIEA. My question relates to the increased use of the or the growing role of nuclear in the energy mix of Central and Euro Eastern European states to secure their own energy security. And one of the potential identified challenges here has been that many of these contracts have gone to, um, and I, I'm not necessarily certain what the state in, in, in the Czech Republic is, but or in, in Czechia. But um, that many of these uh, contracts have gone to Russian firms, such as Rosatom, which I, my question is, is there potentially a risk that you see for creating, mo moving away from the, a dependency on Russian gas and oil, or potentially creating a new dependency for Russian supplied fuel or Russian supplied parts or engineering expertise uh, to try and transition away from that gas to nuclear? Thank you. It differs from country to country. In my country, we actually have a law which was passed before the war that bans Russian and Chinese companies to participate in nuclear tenders. We have it by law. There's one nuclear power plant being prepared to be built. That's a back project in Hungary. There was a similar project in Finland called Haneke, which was canceled last year after the war broke out. I'm not aware of any other Russian project anywhere in Europe. The nearest one would be in Egypt and Turkey. As for fuel, you know, we, we, we do the easy part now. We're replacing Russian fuel with fuel made in West. That's the easy part. The difficult part, and that's something we don't really like to talk much about in the West, is that uh, we had for 30 years this fetish of the lowest possible price. And also we are trying to get everything dirty away from our shores. 
the result of that is that 40% global enrichment capacity is in, is in Russia. And Russia, by the way, supplies, for example, 20% of US nuclear fuel uh, enrichment. So it's easy to switch maker of nuclear fuel, but then you ask, where does the uranium come from, the enrichment? It's a, sometimes a very interesting answer, even from Western companies. But it will take some time. You know, we, we will have to rebuild plenty of capacities which we shut down over the last 30 years. But I would not worry that much when it comes to nuclear. I would say the general switch away from Russia is visible in all areas. I'm more worried about China, to be honest. That would be more difficult in years to come. But you have just a question. Before you have plans to build four new nuclear. We nuclear. we have at the moment and six. Who, who will build those? We have six that? units at the moment. We have forty percent of electricity that comes from nuclear, and we have actually have competition right now. We expect the bids coming by the end of this month. We have the French EDF, uh, Westinghouse of the US, and KHNP of Korea, South Korea. So we'll see. But it can also end up that we will not choose anyone because honestly, the industry is not in the best shape anywhere in the world. You know, I did oversee the nuclear tender we had 10 years ago. And in the end, we did not choose anyone because you know, the delays and the problems of the industry are well known. But we are a very pro-nuclear country. So the public support is very high. And we, we would like to have additional nuclear capacity. So you will open it to tender? We have we have the tender open two okay. years ago. We have we expect the bids actually on October thirty first this month. Okay, thank you. So I have a question at the back, and uh, then I have some questions online. But the ambassador of Hungary then also uh, Liam who done is the name. I remember Joe Public, and uh, I have a long winded question. So not too long winded, okay. please, because I have a number. It's of a breakdown um, for the European energy market in oil, in gas. Nuclear, you say, I think you said was 40%? In my country. In my and country. in, oh, for your country only, in, okay. In Czech, yeah. So this is European only, so. And for um, the green energy, solar, hydro, wind. What's the breakdown now, the present today in 2023? What is your predicted outcome for 2030 when we have 350 million people on the European soil? And the half-life of all those generating facilities, what are they? And by 2050, when we have 600 million people in Europe, what's the capacity like at that stage for where we are? And if what is the mix in the energy at that stage you hope to be? Oh, I don't know if you're that good a prophet. That's got to be an encyclopedic answer. Okay, look, uh, first of all, I think we will have the fossil fuels with us for much longer than people want to assume or want to, want to expect or accept. So oil, gas will remain with Europe much longer than people think, and nuclear fuel as well. No, nobody knows. Well, it very much depends from country to country, first of all. And we're somewhere around 20% across Europe. But the real question is not about capacity installed. The real question is about the overall production of electricity, for example. You know, one thing is that you have, let's say, installed capacity of 1,000 megawatts in wind, but how much electricity generates over the year? That's the big question. Because you have intermittent sources like solar and photovoltaic, which generate electricity for just part of the year. So to that aside, just that green energy, is that 5% of the European market? Is it 10% of the European market? Depends on what day. You have days when you have sunny and windy days. Right. And you can have up to 60%, but then you need backups for that. And you have days when you have this, then you have days when you have the green energy around 5%. A, a, a cold, dark day in Germany. We had those days in winters, usually. January, February would be the days. My country is the second biggest exporter of electricity in the EU after France. Our biggest two buyers are Germany and Austria. So we know fairly well the situation there. And you have days when Germany exports huge amounts of electricity, when it's, wind, when it's windy and sunny. Then you have days when the whole country is running on imports of electricity from France and my country. Now that's, this is a completely new situation, which many Europeans don't really appreciate, that the intermittent sources bring a huge amount of unpredictability into the electricity mix, which wasn't there before. So I'm sorry if I cannot give, give you an answer about every single year. You know, I think... <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. Ireland is probably the only country you can get a high, a high um, 
a calculation of wind uh, energy more so than countries in Central and Eastern Europe. If you'll just excuse me, Ambassador, I'll take a, a question from, uh, from our sure. online audience uh, from Terry Neal, who's an IIEA board member. And Terry asks, for how many years will gas and gas storage be a vital part of any country's energy security? I would say that for most EU member states, natural gas will be the, the backup for renewables for quite some time, because it's easiest to fire up, to come up as a backup. Now, the other option would be coal, and I think coal is really something we don't really feel like using in Europe because of the emissions. So if we are honest about fast build up of green resources with all the intermittences in it, then we have to be also honest about the need for a backup when it's, the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. And that would be most natural gas. Mm -hmm. So I would say decades. Yeah. yeah, for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, yes. And, and to be fine, the backup solution, you know, the batteries, just to give you an idea for those who are happy enough not to be energist people, which is a difficult job to be honest. When Elon Musk uh, unveiled the mega battery in Australia, 100 megawatt hours capacity, you know, journalists call me like, is this the moment? Is this the breakthrough? I was like, okay, well, this is megawatt hour. What we need is 1000 as much or better yet million times as much. We need storage of gigawatt hours or terawatt hours. I mean, what Iran needs are terawatt hours per year. You know, 100 megawatt hours in Australia and our four family houses in Australia per year. That's a mega battery. That's great. That's great for houses. Excellent. We, we sometimes don't appreciate the amount of electricity we consume, how much of it we consume. So until we have the storage able to store basically the, the energy from day to night, and especially from summer to winter, which will be in terawatt hours, the million times as much as we can store today. Until then, I think we will need natural gas or other backup sources. Wow, right. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint. I'm just. No, no, that's that's the reality. And uh, we thank you for that. Ambassador of Hungary, Ambassador, you had a question. Thank you very much. This is Gergely Manhegyi, the Hungarian ambassador to Ireland. I think you partly already answered my question because I wanted to ask you about your views on the role of nuclear energy uh, in the in the renewable sector, how it is how it is serves as a backup for other renewables and how it is helping to 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 level up these uh, these waves. So this was my question. I think you partly already answered it. Look, we can do the usual European game, which is discuss whether nuclear is a low emission or a zero emission. We can spend a whole day with this. I think the French will agree with us. The Germans will be against it. We've been playing this game for for a long time. But if, you, if we are serious about cutting down CO2 emissions, then the answer should be in the longer term, renewables and nuclear. In the countries which allow nuclear, in the countries which don't, it will be renewables with some sort of backup, we don't know which one. And that's it. And certainly so far, we all agree that member states can have the energy mix of their own choosing. So half of member states uses nuclear, the other half does not. We have some very vocal opponents of nuclear, that's fine. That's how it is. I mean, Europe should be diverse. I like Europe when it's diverse. It's a nice continent. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Barry, you had a question. Thank you, Ambassador. I'm uh, Barry Koff for the Director of Research here. My question builds nicely off what you just said about Europe being nice and diverse. And during your remarks, you said that Europe can be tough sometimes. And you made reference to the rollout of the COVID vaccines and also the purchasing of gas. Um, can you describe a little bit more what you said about how that's to the detriment of, I think you specifically said Bangladesh and Pakistan. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about what that means? And my question is, is there a way of having the diversification that we want? I commend your presentation, by the way. Your presentation was wonderful and the picture can speak a thousand words, as Philip said. It was really brilliant. But talking about the diversification that you, that you, uh, that you promote, is there a way of doing it that isn't to the detriment of other places like Bangladesh, Pakistan? Thanks. First of all, thank you for the question, because I've been using this example of Bangladesh, Pakistan for the last year. And I always can see when people know what I'm talking about, they don't ask questions because we all know what we did. 
Bangladesh and Pakistan have a common population of 400 million people, so roughly the EU population. Bangladesh has two LNG terminals to import LNG. Pakistan has one. We sucked out the LNG, which was supposed to go to there, which we overpaid the suppliers, which forced both countries to use more diesel for electricity generation, which raised the price of electricity by 80%. We're talking about two relatively poor countries. So um, you know, we, we tend to ask ourselves in Europe, what can we do more to have the global South to understand? Well, <clears throat> things like this help global South to understand who we are. Don't go to Bangladesh or Pakistan now and talk about energy transition in Europe. It really was not easy for them. And so, so it would be able to be able to buy LNG without detriment for countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh. I think we will need new LNG sources to come online. There should be by 2025, 26. So hopefully we'll be able to get our LNG without hurting others. But if this winter or next winter we need more LNG, I'm I'm fairly positive that's what we will do again. I remember when the vaccines came in the spring of 2021, and we would have our 60-70% vaccinations already done in Europe, and most of the world would be around 1% or 2%. I don't remember Europeans being too offended by that. I remember Europeans being happy about being secure and safe. That's who we are. Let's be honest about it. I mean, we enjoy the, the instances we have. We enjoy the life we have. I'm paid for bluntness. I'm not paid for being diplomat. Ambassador, I have a question from um, James Murphy, who's from our Department of Finance. And he said, firstly, thank you for your presentation. And his question is uh, for the ambassador is regarding how dependent are the Czech Republic and other Central European countries on external non-EU suppliers of energy technologies, such as solar, wind turbines, electrolyzers. Uh, do you see a need for greater state support for domestic manufacturers? Now you've dealt with part of that, but the question, do you see a need for greater state support for domestic manufacturers? There, there is no difference between Central and Western Europe or any other part of Europe on this one. At the moment, we import basically most of those technologies from out of, outside of the EU. Yeah. And as, as I said before, this would be exactly the point of contention for many. I would say in the public, we should have those capacities at home. Mm -hmm. We should basically do what the Americans did last summer, or summer last year, with the Inflation Reduction Act, which has nothing to do with inflation, but a lot to do with America first. And we should do something like this. I have, we will probably not dare to call it Europe first because we are so nice. Mm -hmm. but that's something we should, what we should do. I mean, that's what we actually owe our public. Yes. Yes. When we, when we speak about all those trillions of euro which should be spent on energy transition, I really believe that this money should be spent in our countries. Go with what you may. Yes, but um, do you feel that the European energy policy is is a a big help towards self sufficiency in this area? Do we need to do more? Does the EU need? Just a comment on the EU policy in this regard. Once again, I think crisis helps. Mm -hmm. This was a no topic two years ago. Now it became a topic, especially mm -hmm. because many of the raw materials we need have to be imported. The rare earth metals, nickel, copper, and many others. So the question really is you know, how much we be dependent on outside makers and how much we yeah. arrange ourselves. I yeah. think we will, we will need a European raw materials policy, a, a real one. Not just talk, but real one. No, just a small example. I was in Saskatchewan last month. It was the province of Canada, which has plenty of uranium and other raw materials. So I met two ministers in Regina. I went to Saskatoon, the, the biggest city. I went to North uranium mines. Everywhere I went, the Americans went before me. Oh, and they have now. I think they're building now a raw materials policy. They don't talk about it yet. It will be a big shock to Europe, just like the IRA was shocked summer last year. But they will have one. And it would be very, very tough. And they have moved into Canada as well. Well, they move everywhere. I mean, you, I've met them and I've, you can see them in Latin America and Africa and Asia everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do what we talk about what we should do one day. They've been doing it right now. 
you know, that's interesting. Um, and I think it's it's uh, not easy to follow that without without your explanation. Um, Dylan, I have a question. I also have a, some more online. Yeah. Dylan Marshall, researcher here at the IIA and then limelighting as a mic holder. Um, so I have uh, kind of two questions. Firstly, on the Energy Charter Treaty, uh, which has been quite controversial around Europe and many European states have withdrawn or signaled they wish to withdraw in the near future. And I'm just wondering the position on a number of uh, central uh, European states on that, and specifically the Czech Republic, is there an intention to withdraw or remain within this somewhat controversial treaty, uh, given the impacts it has on the public purse? And then secondly, uh, to pick up on a few threads you talked about in your presentation, which uh, I thought was very good, uh, you discussed about the potential for European citizens in maybe five years to get a bit antsy on the human rights situation, and you gave the example of Equatorial Guinea. But I'm just wondering, uh, given the current situation in, in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, the EU has put a lot of... Uh, hopes on Azerbaijani uh, oil and gas, and there has not been a lot of discussion on the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh, where there's been a lot of uh, accusations of ethnic cleansing and war crimes. And so I'm wondering on your opinion on this situation. Two questions. Then two, two, two easy questions. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, on uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia, I think the silence of the European Union, the US, and others is self explanatory. There's no need for me to say anything more. And sorry, could you have a bit the first one? Yeah. Yeah, you remember now. <laughs> Look, uh, Energy Charter Treaty is from the 1990s, from the time when Europe really believed in a rule based order in this world. And we really. Europe, European Union, European member states really worked on that. And we were hoping for a world in which those rules can work. We were wrong. The world is not a nice place. The world is not a place which will play by European rules. So at the moment, my government coordinates with other governments in the, in the area, especially with Germany, our next approach. But I assume that we should, we should accept the fact that we want to be successful in this area. The world is much, much less pleasant place than we hope it would be in the 1990s. It probably also applies to your second question. Yeah, sobering I'm assessment. sorry about that, I'm sorry. Sobering assessment. We have some nice questions. Sobering please. assessment. I have a, a, an, an Irish question from Dara Lawyer, who is a senior economics researcher. He said, from the point of view of Ireland's energy security, do you think that Ireland should consider becoming more in connected, interconnected with the rest of the European Union, such as through a second electricity interconnector, connecting Ireland's grid to the continent? We have one. Your, your advice on that? Well, look, we had a saying back in 1990s when we built a pipeline for oil to Germany and another one to gas. And we started to buy Norwegian gas in 1997. So we had actually a line in our public presentation saying happiness is a multiple pipeline. <laughs> yeah. And I think in your case, it's a similar story. I mean, you're now building the connection to France, mm -hmm. the De Gallic connection to Normandy. And uh, the, the more the merrier. I mean, it's yeah. costly, of course. All those things are costly until the moment when you need them, and then suddenly they are the only ones you have. Mm -hmm. uh, when my government actually pushed through the contract with Norway back in 1997, we had a huge pushback from some parts of the media, probably funded by a big energy supplier. I have no idea which one. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the line was expensive Norwegian gas. It was like the, the line in the press. This is expensive Norwegian gas. Then came the gas crisis in 2009, no Russian gas coming to Europe. It was suddenly the only gas coming. It wasn't expensive anymore. It was the only one. So for electricity connection, yeah, sure, it's expensive. But I know that there's, there are plans to build ones to different parts of the continent. I think in the end, you will find that the costs of having no electricity for a single day is a big portion of GDP. <laughs> and the cost of building such a connection is actually not that big in that comparison. 
Yes, yeah. we have to take into account in terms of cost, of course, that we're an island behind an island. Um, and uh, where we put our pipeline, it might have to come around a bit. Um, uh, Kian, you have? Thank you very much, Mary, for indulging my second question. Um, this question relates to the role of green hydrogen as secure, as creating kind of resilience and security of supply. You know, it, early in your presentation, you talked about, you know, many, about half of European states will have, will have nuclear as their backup and the other half will have another alternative. And it seems ostensibly in Ireland that alternative will be, will be, could be green hydrogen. And there's a lot of excitement in Ireland about the role that green hydrogen could play in Ireland's economy and Ireland's green transition. I guess I was wondering about your thoughts about, given that this is kind of a growing sector, it's, but it's still very much in its infancy, how, whether or not you believe that Ireland should pin all of its hopes of its green transition or many of its hopes of its green transition on green hydrogen, or should we potentially explore other options? And I'm not going to say what those other options could be, but possibly that. Thank you. Uh, I don't dare to give advice to any government, but mine. Yeah, that's the only one I can advise. Uh, so I can just say what I'm saying in my country about this. There are many different proposals. What could be the possible backup? Hydrogen is at the moment very popular, but when you ask for physical, practical things which you can physically see, it's actually slightly underdeveloped. Most of the technologies are not there yet. So we will see. The big question with hydrogen is long distance transport. At the moment, I'm only aware of the transportation of ammonia from Saudi Arabia to Japan. Uh, the transport of hydrogen in liquid form is something not tested yet. You would need basically to cool it down to 10, 10 grades above uh, absolute zero. Uh, the energy costs of that would be probably about half of the energy in the hydrogen itself. With LNG, it's around 10% of the energy you lose by the liquefaction. So there are many questions around it, and this is a moment of big change, and there are many different proposals, many different technologies, and many people who push for the technologies speak greatly about the advantages, and they don't don't always don't always mention the risks or the fact that the technology is simply it not, is not there yet developed. You, know, you may remember if you've been in the field for a while that about fifteen years ago everybody spoke about, about CCS, carbon capture and storage was always COVID CCS would be in all government documents. And then just stop being there, the CCS, because the first unit of CCS was built in Schwarze Pumpe in Germany, in Brandenburg. And it turned out to make electricity much more expensive than people assumed. And all the calculations were simply not correct. I mean, so I would I believe that practice practice, practice is the, the best measurement of success. And hydrogen has a still a long way to go to prove itself. It will be probably used in some areas. I'm not really sure I would let hydrogen into the, the, the households or to urban areas. It has huge security risks. The mixture of hydrogen with air is, I don't know, hidden work. So there are questions around it, sure. But there are also advantages too. So how it will look like, I don't know. There are at the moment, very, there are several different areas where people push their own proposals, we will see. You have big push on batteries. The, some of those batteries have the small difficulty that they get on caught fire quite easily. Something people probably will, will not like in their homes. That's the situation at the moment. Yeah, this is. Uh, we have actually reached our time, but just one question that I really would like to ask you a broader question before we we uh, conclude this very interesting discussion um, about the role of China in the whole energy security um, area. Is the Chinese economy, as it picks up, likely to impact, say, on energy security in Europe? Uh, will they have uh, a demand? Will they be taking energy from Europe? Uh, what kind of geopolitical um, impact will China have on the energy security in Europe? You know, it's, it's interesting. A year ago, everybody would worry that when COVID is over and China picks up, it will suck all the energy we need. Mm. Now, everybody worries that the pickup in China is not fast enough and China is not doing it as well as it was supposed yes. to do. So 
I guess, economy of its size will have impact on Europe no matter what. Whether they do well or badly, they will always impact us. How it, how it will happen? I go fairly regularly to East Asia and Southeast Asia, and you know, Japan, South Korea, and Kuala Lumpur, and Malaysia, or in Singapore. The first question is the first question is always about China, not so much about Europe. That's funny, yes. And yeah. I ask them in the same question basically: How do you see it? Nobody really knows. It's uh, it's very difficult to get any reliable data from inside the country. Right. Mm -hmm. So we just wait and see as it picks up and the effect uh, on the whole. But geo, as you said at the outset of your talk, the geopolitical uh, world is now very disrupted, and um, you know so many different. Uh, conflicts throughout and so many different challenges and of course energy security uh, as we say which has such a huge impact right down to the individual level uh, uh, industrial level climate change level um, and uh, all we can do is just um, work to try and mitigate the, the difficulties as they arise but thank you most sincerely for your talk which was uh, incredibly interesting and uh, thought provoking. And I think we'll take away a lot from it. So thank you for coming. Thank you to the colleagues mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, Czech embassy for organizing it and our colleagues in the IIEA. But again, many thank thanks you. and thank, thank you for coming. You.